So, yeah, thank you very much for, first of all, for the invitation to this conference. And uh, I feel most inspired by all the presentations. And so I, what I will do now is actually do a little summary, in a sense. Well, Jordan has already done a summary, actually, of the whole conference. But I will kind of get back to it and also refer to some images that was just uh, mentioned, that images are important. Uh, I will have five slides, so and uh, about ten minutes. So, um, on I will have about two minutes for each slide. Uh, we have not made a choreography in before, uh, Jolyon and me. So I was actually a little bit shocked when he started his presentation because I had an idea for this response, and I wasn't aware, of course, what you were going to do. But <clears throat> uh, I will kind of connect to that as well. Okay, five slides, as I said. So my first point is, and you, I will not mention now the names of the speakers, but you can easily detect from what you said, uh, uh, what I refer now to. Public theology as a narrative, and I mean a listening and a communicating practical theology. I would even call practical theology a life science, uh, especially due to the public discourses on who is actually responsible for life sciences. So I start with an image. And Jolien was uh, already kind of mentioning it. So what I will do actually in my response, I will also come back to Duncan Forrester and to exactly the text you were mentioning on the church and concentration camps. And I will go a bit more into that. You already uh, mentioned uh, what he did in his uh, book on um, theological fragments. So here we are. That's the picture of the church. And Duncan Forrester says, just outside the perimeter wire, there stood a graceful little 18th century church, freshly painted and with a typical central European onion dome on the top of its tower. It was probably Roman Catholic, but it might possibly have been evangelical. That really didn't matter. That sentence is very important uh, right in a minute. Here was a Christian church, almost certainly regularly used for worship, standing less than 100 meter yards from the fence, visible to anyone moving about inside the camp. So that's what he's reporting in his text um, on that being on that journey with a family uh, coming along Dachau and seeing that chapel. So just to start, public theology as a narrative, practical theology, uh, as it was mentioned already, Duncan's books are full of this very important insightful narratives. Second point, public theology as public church theology. Again, the same image. But now he continues in his text. And you were kind of mentioning that already. Um, oh, yeah, we have to go here. Outside the camp with Jesus, that's his question. So he's now looking at the responsibility of the church during that time. Did that church provide an escape from the awful reality so close by? Did the congregation meeting in that little church in the shadow of Dachau raise up prophets who dared to denounce the system and confront the evil? Almost certainly the answer to that is no. For that church outside the perimeter fence at Dachau stand in a sense, and that was already just mentioned by you, David, in a sense for every church, although it's local, it's local is apparently so much more extreme and demanding. So I see one of the key issues, actually, of public theology as what does it mean to be a public church that has already been mentioned. My third point. Yeah, public theology as, sorry, I have to just have two different kind of slides in front of me, as ethical and passionate theology. There was a lot uh, of talk about yesterday of, of the passionate dimension of theology. Again, what Duncan does, actually, he now continues in his text and asks, what happened inside the camp? Was, was it with Jesus? So he says, quote, and yet in our scenario, it is in the camp rather than the church that the saints, martyrs, and heroes are in all probability to be found. The actual visible church to, to, to which we belong falls far short of living up to its calling. That's the critique. It's very moving in his text where he really looks into the question, how do, did people deal within concentration camp with this evil 
and he finds a lot of solidarity, a lot of charity. And so he asks, where actually was Jesus? So I think that's a very important point of public theology, just being passionate. And, and this text and many others of Duncan I've read are full of this passion. Now, I have actually to, to disappoint all of you. Um, when I read this text of Duncan, I thought I need to get a picture of this church because I was once or twice a visitor at Dachau. I can't remember, actually, a story that a church has been ever so close to the fence of a concentration camp. So what happened, actually? So I was looking up, searching for slides, searching for images of that church. I found this one. And this must have been about the view that Duncan had. But to disappoint you, he was actually completely wrong. Why? Well, that's the point. We are talking about this. We're talking about a Russian Orthodox chapel built its name is Resurrection of Our Lord, located just to the left of the tourist entrance into the um, crematory area at the Dachau Memorial site, built by members of the Russian Armed Forces and dedicated on April 29, 1995, the 50th anniversary of the liberation of the Dachau concentration camp by American troops. The chapel is set upon a mound that has come some soil that was brought from the former Soviet Union. Now, I mention this, I don't think it's a problem, actually, that Duncan got the wrong idea of the church, because I think there is something like public theology as a humble, reconciliatory, and anamnetic theology. I find that actually very important, and you can also see this in this chapel. So, here we are, should go back, sorry. Um, here. Also, to quote from this text, Anamnesis is at the core not just of sacramental life and faith, but gives significance to our lives even in hellish camps and holds hope for the future. The story must be told if we are to have dignity and expectation. We find not some universally valid pattern of being the church, but rather to learn from the failures and the triumphs of the past how God is calling us to be the church. Again, I find that very important as dimensions of public theology, being humble itself, having this reconciliatory dimension and perspective, and also being anamnetic. I come to my final point. Public theology as faithful, prophetic, that was uh, the debate yesterday and also this morning, prophetical, I would rather call it a visionary and eschatological theology, seeking to restore broken, or you could also say fragmented lives. I, I would actually say, uh, connecting to the discussion just before break, that when Duncan Forrester, as far as I've read him, speaks of fragmented, he, he has actually in mind the, the fragmented, uh, fragmented individuals and their existence, very much at least. So I continue with an image, and this is actually within this memorial chapel. So if Duncan and his wife had moved into, or had gone into the chapel, he would have exactly faced this icon. Uh, so it's a painting of the resurrected, uh, resurrected Christ. You see that leading the camp inmates out of their barracks. And also, and that's ex uh, the eschatological point, um, um, through the gate that is held open by angels. And so to quote finally, Duncan again, actually, actually in this text still, he says at the end, we are seeking above all to attend to the church Lord who calls the church to be a manifestation not so much of goodness as of grace, of achievement as of faithfulness. So I would actually say public theology is, when we talk about the futures of public theology, there will be a future uh, of public theology as long as lives are at stake, as long as lives are seeking to be restored because they are broken and fragmented. Thank you very much.